Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back. It's a pleasure to introduce Chelsea Finn. Chelsea is a PhD student at Berkeley, has also worked at Google uh, for a while. Um, Chelsea is very well known for uh, pioneering the combination of uh, deep learning and robotics through methods like guided policy search, uh, guided cost learning, and also um, model-based reinforcement learning. And she'll tell us a little more about these ideas right now. Thanks, Chelsea. So my name is Chelsea Finn. In this lecture, I'm going to be covering model-based reinforcement learning. Uh, so a quick outline of what I'm going to be covering in this lecture. First, I'm going to be motivating why we want to use model-based approaches. Second, I'll be covering some of the main model-based reinforcement learning approaches. Uh, then I'll be talking about using local models and guided policy search, which have lead, led to great results on real robots. And lastly, I'm going to be talking about the ability to handle high-dimensional observations when using model-based approaches. Okay, um, so first with some motivation. One of the primary reasons that you might want to use model-based approaches is for sample efficiency. And for this, I'm going to quickly kind of go over some of the approaches that you've seen thus far in this course and look at the different, look at the sample efficiency of these approaches. Um, so some of the things that you've seen so far are gradient-free methods, fully on online methods like actor critic, like A3C, uh, policy gradient methods like trust region policy optimization, replay buffer value estimation methods like DQN, DDPG, uh, model-based deep RL, which I'll be talking about this in, in this lecture, and model-based shallow reinforcement learning, which uses uh, linear models. Um, so first, gradient-free reinforcement learning methods. Um, there was a paper by OpenAI recently that showed that you can learn complex behaviors with gradient-free methods, uh, but at the cost of using much more samples than the other sorts of approaches that we'll be looking at um, here and that you've seen today. Uh, and one thing... Uh, that we found is that one thing that you can see in the literature if you look at a certain problem, and in this I'll look at the Chaff-Sheeta problem, which is a, a benchmark in the Majoko domain, um, you'll see that fully online methods tend to be about 10x more sample efficient, require 10x fewer samples. Um, so here's a, a graph, and generally to perform the Chaff-Sheeta task, it requires around 100 million samples, uh, 100 million steps to complete the task successfully. Uh, then if you look at Policy gradient methods, uh, for example, trust region policy optimization, they require about 10x fewer samples on roughly the same problem. These, there's some slight differences between the environment and in these papers. Uh, this is going to be looking at the, this is at the half sheet environment, but they're roughly comparable, at least on an order of magnitude. Um, so generally, the policy gradient methods tend to be about 10x faster uh, than fully online methods. Uh, if you then look at replay buffer value estimation methods, like uh, in this particular case, NAF, you then, again get about 10x improvement in terms of sample efficiency. Um, and you can actually run, this, run these sorts of methods on a real robot in about three hours of real time. Okay, and then next if you go to model-based deep RL methods, you again see another 10x gap. Um, so this is a, a recent paper by Yevgen Chabotar, and they were able to learn tasks in about 20 minutes of experience on a real robot. Um, and then lastly, if you're using linear models, you can also get about another 10x improvement. Um, and generally with these model-based methods, you might have to, like, might have to use um, more assumptions about the environment, about the task you're trying to learn. And that's what we'll be covering today. Okay, um, so that's, that shows the sample efficiency. We can get dramatically more sample efficient methods with model-based methods. Um, the second benefit of using model-based approaches is they're generally more transferable across tasks. So if you learn a model of the world, if you learn a predictive model of what the environment looks like, you can reuse this model for achieving different tasks. If you learn a single policy, that policy is good for one task. Whereas if you're able to predict what the environment's gonna look like, that's independent of the task that you're trying to achieve. And then you can then plan with that model to be able to achieve different tasks. Um, and I'll be giving some more examples of this later in the lecture. Okay, um, so these are kind of the two main approaches, two main benefits for using model-based methods. Uh, there are others, but these are uh, kind of the two things, two reasons why you might want to use model-based methods. Okay, um, so next we'll overview model-based reinforcement learning methods. So um, generally, reinforcement learning algorithms look something like this, where you start with generating samples, shown in orange, fit a model to estimate your return, shown in green, 
use that model to improve the policy. And then once you've improved your policy, generate samples again and repeat. Um, so what this looks like in a policy gradient setting is uh, when you fit a model to estimate the return, you, you're computing your policy gradient. And when you improve the policy, you're running gradient descent using that policy gradient. Uh, in Q-learning-based methods, when you estimate the return, you're going to be fitting a Q-value function. And then you improve your policy using uh, taking the max of that Q. Um, and lastly, in model-based approaches, what you do is you fit this model, uh, the, the transition function, and optimize your policy using the model that you fit. Um, so this is kind of how model-based reinforcement learning fits with the other types of algorithms. And you're going to be generally following the same procedure, but you're going to be using different mathematical uh, formalisms to fit the model and improve the policy. Um, okay, so uh, here's, here's the model-based approach. In order to estimate the model, we can just use supervised learning to minimize the difference between what our model predicted and the next state. Um, and then there's different ways that we can do that, different ways to represent the model. That's what we'll be talking about today. And there's also different ways that you can improve the policy using that model. Um, the first approach for improving your policy uh, is to simply backpropagate your model, backpropagate gradients for your reward function through the model. Um, so this is kind of a, a diagram of what the environment looks like, where pi is your policy, f is your model, and r is your reward function. And what you can do is if you have a model of the environment, then you can just backpropagate your expected reward through your model into your policy. Um, this is quite simple. Uh, and what this looks like as an algorithm is first run some base policy. This could be a random policy to collect data. Learn a model using that data, using supervised learning. And then backpropagate derivatives for the reward function into, through, through your model into the policy to optimize your policy. Okay, so this is kind of the basic vanilla model-based reinforcement learning. Does it work? Well, um, in many cases, it does work. So this is essentially how system identification works in classical robotics. Um, you do need to take some care in designing a good policy for collecting data. Uh, and it can be particularly effective if you can hand engineer a representation of your dynamics using some prior knowledge about how physics works or, or how your environment is going to look and then fit just a few parameters of that model. Um, so in many cases, this can work. Uh, but in other cases, it won't work. Um, so let's, let's look at an example. Say that you are, have an agent that's on this cliffside. Um, first, you run your base policy, maybe using this red, uh, the, the base policy takes this red trajectory. Um, this is your base policy. Then you're going to fit a model to the rollout from your policy. Um, and what you might learn is if you go right, you go higher. Um, and if your goal is to get to the top of the peak, then you want to go right. Um, if you then backpropagate through this model into your policy, what your policy will learn is to go right. And then you'll fall off the cliff. Um, and so what happened here? What, what was the issue here? Well, the distribution of states that you trained your model on was different than the distribution of states underlying your final policy. Um, and so, as a result, your model wasn't accurate in the distribution of states that you visited after you optimized your policy. Um, and this distribution mismatch problem can actually get even worse in settings where you use more expressive models. So how can we do better? How can we make the distribution of states uh, that we're going to train our model on equal to the distribution of states on our final policy? What we can do is we can collect data from our policy and then refit our model using that policy. Um, so what this looks like as an algorithm is first we're going to run our base policy, learn a model, backpropagate our model into our policy just like before, and then run our policy that we learned, appending the visiting tuple state action next date to our data set, and then refit our model using the new data. Um, so this can work more effectively because you can refit your model using the new states that you visited and get a more accurate model in those states. OK. Um, well, so now what if we run our policy and we make a mistake? Um, and, and what we might do is we might fall off the cliff. For, for uh, modeling a car, 
we might start moving to the right if our model is inaccurate. Uh, or moving to the left in this case. One way that we can do better is after we take a step, after we take an action, we can actually replan using our model to figure out how to get back on track. What this looks like is we first run our policy, uh, for example, a random policy, fit our model, back, back propagate through our model to choose actions, execute the first plan action, observe the resulting state, and then uh, append that to your data set, and then go back to step three on the second state and replan for the actions that you want to take at that next state. And as a result, you can, if you made a mistake, if you visited a state that you didn't think you were going to get to, according to your model, you can then replan according to your model and try to get back on track. Um, and then after you've been doing this, this replanning step, after n steps, you go back and refit your model using the data. Um, so this is what's called model predictive control, which is essentially uh, a fancy term for saying that we're going to be replanning our actions in real time as we execute our actions, as we execute our policy. And this can help with model errors. Um, basically, to account for when we make a mistake, we can then try to correct for it in real time as we take actions. Question. Uh, in practice, you could. In general, uh, most approaches that I've seen do not do that, um, but you could do something like that. Uh, generally, if you train on all of your data long enough, then you're, uh, you should be able to do reasonably at all of the data. And actually, we'll talk about an approach that kind of reweights the data in, in a little bit. So can you repeat your question? Um, yeah, so the, when you say what uh, resulting state is something we expected, that's solely based on the transition model, model not any reward based model. Yes, yeah, that's based off of the, the transition model. And the planning procedure, when you uh, back propagate through your model, that's with respect to the reward function. OK, um, so, so far, I talked about one way to choose actions, which is by backpropagating through your model. There's actually another way to choose actions. Um, so instead of backpropagating through your model into your policy, one thing that you can do is you can instead use a sampling-based approach. Um, so what this looks like is you first sample a bunch of different action sequences into the future from some distribution. Maybe it could be a uniformly random distribution. It could also be another distribution. Run those actions through your predictive model. So given your initial state and your sequence of actions that you sampled, just imagine what's going to happen in the future using your model. And then pick the future, pick the, the trajectory that you like the best according to your model, and execute the corresponding action. Um, so this is uh, another approach. You can, there's also more sophisticated sampling-based methods to optimize your policy. Uh, this is a pretty simple approach, and actually it can work quite well. So there's a recent paper by Anusha Nagabandi who showed that with this approach, uh, in a neural network model, you could learn how to have a, an ant here, for example, follow a trajectory. You can actually follow any trajectory that you might want it to do. And it can also uh, learn other tasks, like uh, if you learn a model for the swimmer, it can also very efficiently learn how a, a swimming gait. Um, it can learn this much more efficiently than model-free approaches, although it couldn't, um, with a purely model-based approach, it wasn't able to achieve as high a reward as the model-free approach. And there's other examples as well. OK, um, so to summarize so far, I covered a few different versions for model-based reinforcement learning. The first is just collect random samples, train a dynamics model, and plan using that model. Um, a benefit is it's quite simple, uh, no iterative procedure, so it's just a one-time thing. Um, but you can get that distribution mismatch problem. The second version is to iteratively, iteratively collect data and then refit your model to the new data that you receive. Um, this is also simple, and it can solve the distribution mismatch problem, but you might make mistakes with a perfect model, with an imperfect model, sorry. And then uh, the last version that I covered is where you iteratively collect data and replan using model predictive control. And this can, is, is more robust to model errors, because you can correct for your mistakes after you make them, but 
it can be computationally expensive because you actually have to perform the planning procedure online as you're executing, um, which can be challenging in real-time domains. Okay. Uh, yes. Um, so, yeah, that humans definitely use, have the ability to plan in their environment and achieve different goals. Um, I think that humans use both model-based and model-free approaches. Um, in many aspects, you are, and, yeah, in many aspects, you're kind of reacting to things rather than planning. Um, and I think that some of the most interesting, th interesting algorithms are ones that combine model-based and model-free approaches. And I'll touch on that a little bit at the end. Yeah. Yeah, so when you, when you iteratively retrain, when you iteratively train the model, typically you'll warm start it by the previous iteration of model that you trained. Okay, um, and then I also covered two different ways to optimize your policy with respect to a model. Uh, the first is to simply backpropagate gradients through the model into your policy. And the second is a sampling-based optimization, where you sample from your model and, uh, and pick actions according to those samples. Okay. Um, what kind of models can we use? Well, uh, it actually, in, in some of the previous literature, Gaussian processes, Gaussian processes have been quite popular for using models because they can, uh, uh, well, I'll talk a little bit more about GPs in a second. Uh, you can also use neural networks. Um, and there are other models that you can use as well. Uh, for Gaussian processes, typically what this looks like is you have an input of your state in action and an output of the next state. Uh, one of the benefits of Gaussian processes is that they can be extremely data efficient. Um, they can also uh, they're not great with smooth dynamics. Uh, they can actually model the uncertainty of the future, which is something that can be quite challenging to do with neural networks. Um, and another con is that when the data set is big, they're extremely slow. So they suffer from the curse of dimensionality and that they don't scale well to um, large amounts of data. Uh, in terms of neural networks, again, this, the input is the state in action and the output is the next state. Uh, Euclidean training loss with model based uh, with with a neural network corresponds to a Gaussian distribution over your next state conditioned on your current state in action, uh, and you could also use more complex losses to uh, to correspond to more complex distributions like a Gaussian mixture model, for example. Um, and the benefits of these approaches is that they can they can be extremely expressive and they can scale well to using lots of data, but they're not so great in the low data regime. So if you only have a small amount of data for fitting your model as you're like starting off learning, uh, neural networks will do very poorly in that domain in general. Um, and another approach that you could use uh, that might be actually a bit more realistic to, or more specific to the physical world, and, and better tailored for the physical world, is to uh, use another model like a Gaussian mixture model, fit a Gaussian mixture model to the state action next state tuples which can model which modes of the dynamics that you're in. Train uh, a GMM on SA, S prime, and then condition your model on the current state in action to get your dynamics model. Um, and then for the ith mixture element of your GMM, your PI of SA will give the region where the mode PI is valid. Um, and so this, this is something that can be quite relevant and quite, basically fits a lot of the assumptions of the real world. Like, uh, for example, if you're a robot, if you're in contact, the dynamics are going to act quite differently than if you're out of contact. Um, and the different modes of, of this GMM can represent those different modes of the dynamics. Um, there's other classes of domain-specific models. Um, for example, you could actually have a real physical model of the world with just a few physical parameters that are unknown, and you could try to fit those, mo those parameters um, with supervised learning. Um, another class of models that I'll touch on briefly later in the lecture also is if you have very high dimensional observations like images, you could use something like a video prediction model um, to represent your dynamics model. Okay. So I just covered some of the main model-based reinforcement learning approaches. Next I'll be talking about an approach using local models. So 
thus far we've been learning a global model. So the, a global model is just basically just uh, where f is represented by some big neural network. It could also be a GP or something like that, um, like I mentioned before. And one of the challenges with this is if you apply model-based reinforcement learning with a global model, the planner, when you actually optimize with respect to that model, it will seek out regions where the model is extremely optimistic uh, and, and where the model is making mistakes. Um, if, if there are regions where your model is inaccurate and is optimistic uh, erroneously, then the optimizer will find those settings and, and basically exploit the model in regions where it's making mistakes. Um, so this can be a big issue. Uh, and in general, it's, it's quite difficult to get a perfect model, uh, to get a model that isn't overly optimistic in, in some areas of the state space. And so for these methods to work, you need to get a very good model in, in most areas of the state space to be able to converge to an accurate policy. Um, and then lastly, in some tasks, the model is much more complex than the policy. Uh, for example, if you want to pour some liquid from a cup, for example, the model of the liquid in that cup and, and how it pours out of the cup into wherever you're pouring it to is quite complex. Whereas the policy is quite simple. You just need to move your arm uh, through a certain motion. Question. So, let's see, I guess if, one example might be if you if you have a model uh, for pushing an object, for example, um, maybe the model, if, if you're close to the object but not quite on it, it will think that you'll still push the object. Um, and it, maybe it thinks that you'll push it quite well, you'll push it in the direction that you want it, the object to go in ultimately. Then the optimizer will find that, that place where the model thinks that the object will be pushed very well. And it will say, okay, I'm going to take a sequence of actions through, through this pushing motion. Um, yeah, and then there's also, if there's areas of the state space where the model hasn't been trained on, then it's like the model has no idea what's going to happen in those areas of the state space. Uh, and it might actually think that like, very good things happen. Uh, that basically, good things meaning things that will achieve high reward. You'll visit states with high reward. And then your policy, the, the, when you optimize that model, it, then the policy is going to want to go to visit those states that seem really good, um, when in reality they aren't. Yeah. So in double GQN, you fit a second Q function. Um, in model-based reinforcement learning, we're just fitting a model of our dynamics and not actually modeling the reward function. So there's nothing quite analogous to double GQN in the model-based setting. Um, Yes. Yeah. So if you're, if you have a, if you know, if you have uncertainty essentially for like what areas that your model works well in, if you have a probabilistic model, then you can uh, try to exploit that uncertainty to stay in areas where your model is certain about what's going to happen. Um, I think there's work in that area, but I don't have any explicit references. It's the same. Um, the difference is just uh, which model class you use. 
If you have a good model of uncertainty, uh, then yes, you can mitigate this issue to a large degree. Um, getting uncertainty estimates with expressive models like neural networks is quite challenging. Yeah. Um, so I'll talk about that next. So that's a good, a good segue. Um, so one thing that you can do is you can use what's called a local model. So if you're going to be backpropagating through your model into your policy, uh, what you really need is you need the derivatives of your, your next state with respect to your current state and your next state with respect to your action, as well as the derivatives of your reward with respect to your state and the reward with respect to your action. Um, we already know the second two derivatives, um, so we really we need, what we need to be able to learn in our model-based approach is just these derivatives, these first two derivatives of our model with respect to our state and our action. Um, and so one thing that we can do is we can actually just fit these derivatives around our current trajectory or our current policy, only in the region that we've been currently exploring. Um, so what this looks like is say that this is uh, kind of our current policy, these are the trajectories of our current policy. We can fit a distribution at each time step around those set of trajectories and fit a, a local policy to these trajectories. So uh, we can model the probability of a, a, the local policy of the probability of the action given the state for these set of trajectories. Um, this is what I'll call a local policy and fit a local dynamics model around that and figure out how to improve your policy locally around the current set of trajectories. Um, okay, so kind of what this procedure looks like is we can run this local policy on our agent to collect a data set of trajectories, fit a dynamics model around those trajectories. Uh, the dynamics model, for example, could be some Gaussian where the mean is a function of your current state and action. Uh, and locally it could be something quite simple. If you're only fitting a local model that only needs to be accurate in some small region, to be something simple like a time varying linear policy, a uh, linear model um, that is linear in the state and in the action. And then the derivatives of your next state, the derivatives of your model uh, are just A and B in this setting. Uh, then once you have these derivatives, you can then improve your policy using that local model and repeat. Um, so this is kind of the overview I'll cover two specific things about how this works next. So first, how do we fit these dynamics? Um, so you have your, some data set of state action next state. Uh, one thing that you can do is if you want to fit this local linear model, uh, you can just use linear regression at each time step uh, using this model. Uh, one thing if you want to do a little bit better is you can actually use Bayesian linear regression, um, which means that just instead of just doing linear regression, use your favorite global model of the dynamics across all time steps and use that global model as a prior for linear regression when you fit each the, the local linear model at each time step. Okay, um, so this is how we can fit the dynamics. What if we fit our dynamics model and go too far away from our dynamics model? What if we try to improve our policy in spaces where our model isn't accurate? Um, well, what can happen is if we, for example, fit our model around this time step, uh, and the model isn't very accurate in that time step, then you might get trajectories like this or trajectories like this that aren't going to be very good because your model wasn't accurate in those areas of the state space. Um, so instead, if you constrain it to constrain your update to be close to the current trajectories, close to the, where the current model is accurate, then you can ensure that you'll get an improvement with respect to your current policy, your current set of trajectories. Um, so how can we stay close to, our, to where our model is relevant, to where our model is accurate? Um, well, if this is your, your trajectory distribution, um, what you can do is you can try to ensure that your new trajectory distribution is close to your old trajectory distribution. Um, and if your trajectory distribution is close, then your dynamics will also be close. Um, well, what does close mean? In this setting, close is going to mean the KL divergence between your new policy and your old policy. And we're going to constrain the KL divergence to be within some bound. 
Um, this is very similar to trust region policy optimization, which you saw earlier in this uh, in this bootcamp. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so this yeah, this can certainly hurt exploration. Um, this is like definitely a local optimization, local trajectory optimization method. Um, and if you're if you need to explore uh, a method like this, will won't do very well. Yeah. Yeah, so this, a base, in general, model-based approaches can struggle with extremely disjoint dynamics um, because if you're going to be back-propagating through your dynamics into your policy and you have discontinuities in your model, it's the great, you aren't going to have good gradient signal in, that, in those settings. Yeah. Yeah, um, one thing that you can do is you could use some sort of validation set and evaluate how good your model is on that validation set. Um, the other thing you could do is you can have, generally get an idea for how much data your model needs by uh, just running it and see how well it works. Um, basically, the, the, the amount of data that you collect when you fit, before you fit in your model uh, can be a hyperparameter that you tune. Um, and one thing, yeah, I'll, I'll get back to that in a second. Okay, uh, so this is, we talked about how we can fit the dynamics, uh, how we can constrain the policy to be close to the set of trajectories that we just visited. Um, and so kind of to summarize what this algorithm looks like is first we run our base policy to collect our data set, learn a local model around the trajectories that we just visited, uh, for example, using linear regression or linear regression under a prior. Then we update our local policy using the local model with the KL constraint to constrain the policy uh, to be close to the most recent policy that we optimized. And then run our local policy, putting the new visited tuples into our data set and repeat. Um, so this is going to be an iterative process where we iteratively improve our local policy um, to be better and better using these local models. Um, one way that you can update your local policy is by backpropagating. Uh, if you actually have a simple model class, you can use something called iterative LQR, um, which is specialized to the setting where you have linear dynamics or, or time varying linear dynamics, and uh, a, a reward function that can be that is quadratic or can be approximated as quadratic. Um, I'm not going to go into the details here, but you can uh, learn more about it. Uh, for example, in this paper, uh, Love and Abiel, and Abiel NIPS 14, or in uh, other resources as well. Okay, um, any questions before I move on to some results? Yeah. Um, so typically you'll update your local model only with respect to the most recent data. Um, and if you are learning a global model to act as a prior for that local model, then uh, that can either use the most recent data or all of the data, um, depending on the algorithm. It, yeah. Yes, question. In this setting, the global model is just used as a prior for fitting the local model, and the local model is actually what's used to improve the policy. Yes, and I'll talk about that in like two minutes. Um, so this is uh, a paper that uses this idea of, of learning local models to fit local policies. Um, and it, pretty clear, the local policy is going to be represented by a linear Gaussian, time varying linear Gaussian distribution. Um, okay, so this is, uh, first this is what the learning process looks like. So uh, first, the robot is taking somewhat random trajectories and iteratively it's going to be improving its policy so that it stays close to the most recent policy, as well as uh, 
improving the reward using the local dynamics model that was fit. Um, and as you can see, it, it, it gets better and better as it takes more trajectories, as it improves, uh, as it, well, yeah, it get, oh, iteratively gets better by refitting its local model and re improving its policy using that local model. Um, so in this setting, the reward function was measured as the distance between the red block and, well, the negative distance of, between the red block and the goal position. And you can measure that because the robot is holding the red block, so you can measure the pose of the gripper um, at any point. Um, so far, I've only talked about one local, well, uh, you, you also iteratively refit your global model in the setting. Um, I'll talk about having more than one local model in a second. Yeah. Um, do you mean measurement noise with respect to the reward function? Uh, in practice, you do need a good reward function. That, that's, uh, if you, for example, uh, like move the whole setup, it won't be able to know that the reward function has changed. Um, you, you need to have a good reward function in order to be able to use these sorts of approaches. Um, in general, I think the fact that it works on a real system means that it can handle the types of noise that we have in a real system. Um, so in practice, we haven't seen, haven't seen noise in these settings to be a huge issue. Yes. Yes. So in this work, the basically the, the most recent experience from a single starting position uh, was used to define locality. Um, there actually has been some follow-up work on this in a paper called "Reset Free Guided Policy Search" that used um, locality in state space to fit local models. Okay. Um, so that was an example of the learning process and. You can learn more things than, than putting a Lego block onto another block. Here are some of the resulting learned behaviors using this approach. Um, so a couple examples of stacking Lego blocks in different settings, as well as putting a, uh, a ring on top of a peg, ring onto a peg, uh, inserting the wheels of an airplane into an airplane, et cetera. I um, mean, all of these skills, this, this method is extremely efficient, so all these skills can be learned on the order of five minutes, five to 10 minutes. Um, okay, so here's, uh, for example, the learning curve, and so you can see uh, here a sample is a five-second trial, and all of them are using extremely small amounts of samples compared to uh, what you've seen thus far in the boot camp. Okay, um, so this is, this is the summary approach, summary kind of algorithm that I showed before, and the end result is a single local policy uh, to be able to go from a single initial state to uh, some target, in it, target state uh, or, or target pose. So what if we want to learn a more expressive policy? A policy that can start from any initial state or a policy that uses vision, for example. Um, one thing we can do is we can do, uh, use an algorithm called guided policy search. So what guided policy search does is it supervises a single global policy to mimic multiple local policies. So if you have a different local policy from different initial states, you can use supervised learning to have the local policy try to imitate each of those local policies in all of the settings um, in order to get a global policy that can uh, succeed in a number of positions. Uh, and using the store of supervised learning, you can also tackle vision-based inputs, which I'll show in a second. Um, so in, in the vision-based setting, 
we're going to assume that at training time we know the low dimensional state. For example, say we want it, our robot to be able to insert the red block into the shape starting cube. We're going to assume that we uh, know where the shape starting cube is during training so we can apply the approach that I talked about previously. But at test time, we want to just be able to have the robot uh, learn how to have the robot be able to insert the block into the cube just from pixel input, from, from high dimensional vision based input. Um, well, what we can do is we're going to assume that we know the target position. Uh, we can take samples for each target position um, and optimize local controllers for each of those target positions, fit a local model, solve for the local policy for each target position, and then use supervision from the local policy to train a global neural network policy. And instead of giving the global neural network policy the target position, we're only going to give it the image, the, the image that is observed from the camera. Um, so as a result, you can learn vision-based policies. Uh, so what this looks like is the robot is moving the shape starting cube into different positions. It's learning local policies for each position. And the learned local policies are going to be act as supervision for a single global policy that's going to map from the camera input to the, uh, to the actions. Um, this approach isn't specific to inserting blocks into shape sorting cubes. Um, this is some of the results that you can get at test time. You can also learn to, uh, for example, put a claw of a toy hammer underneath a nail, screw a cap onto a bottle, uh, and uh, we also you put a coat hanger onto a rock. Um, so in each of these settings, we're decomposing the problem into different positions of the target object and learning local policies for each of those, and then using the local policy as supervised learning for a global policy. Okay, and then there's also some failure cases if you uh, close the camera, for example, if you block the camera, for example. Um, so all of these skills were learned with less than 300 trials, which is about 25 minutes of robot time per task. Um, there's some additional computation time for training the policy, um, but in terms of sample complexity, this is the sample complexity. Um, so the pros are that you can e efficiently learn complex vision-based skills. And uh, one of the downsides is you do require state during training time uh, in order to train these policies. <laughs> okay, question. So, uh, this general on the training the robotic did you do all these things on the PR2 or did you do it on a like the Z4 and right? It was all done on the PR2. In this work, we didn't use any regularization. We did pre-train the vision component of the network to predict the pose of the target object. Um, and that, uh, so we basically just moved around the target object in the robot's arm and trained some policy to predict the pose and used the, those weights as pre-training for the policy. And we also pre-trained the initial set of convolution weights on an image net, uh, on weights trained on ImageNet. And we did, that was just for Conv1. So to get some nice filters as initialization. Yeah. Yeah, um, one thing that helps is putting a penalty on the actions to encourage it to not execute as much torque uh, and take the most direct path. on more diverse data would be kind of my number one recommendation, or adding noise to the policy as you collect data so that the model can, is, is accurate outside of that region. Okay, um, I want to move on so I can get to the end. So the last thing I want to talk about is handling high dimensional observations. So I, I talked about this a little bit before uh, with guided policy search results. 
But what if we only have access to high dimensional observations during training? Um, and so kind of here's a diagram. Typically, a lot of the reinforcement learning approaches that we've seen so far, we assume that we can access the state, the low dimensional state S, um, and that you, uh, yeah. And instead, what if you only have, what if you could only observe the O's here, um, which are often high dimensional, don't give you all the information that is contained in the state. Um, so kind of an example of this, what if you want your robot to be able to use a spatula to pick up an object and put it into the bowl? Um, if you only have the images, you don't know where that object is, uh, and you can't actually, uh, yeah, you don't know where that object is, you can't track it. And also, you don't have a clear reward function when you only have observations. You don't know when you've succeeded at the task. You can't directly observe when you've succeeded at the task and how well you're doing at the task. Um, so this is another big challenge. Um, so one option for getting a reward, func reward function is to provide an image of the goal. Um, for example, uh, an image like this. There are other ways to provide, provide signal for how to perform the task, um, but this is one of them. Yeah, I'm not gonna go over the other ones in this lecture. Um, so there's three different approaches for solving this setting. The first is learning a model in some latent space that you learn. The second one that I'll talk about is learning a model directly of your high dimensional observations. And the last one is uh, learning inverse models, which I won't get to in this lecture. Was there a question? Um, in the experiments that I'll show, they're gonna be monocular images. Uh, in some settings, you can also get depth, although depth can get its own challenge, have its own challenges like transparent objects, reflective objects, and can be quite noisy. No, um, we're not gonna be using imitation learning. I'll touch briefly on imitation learning in the lecture after lunch um, and learning from demonstrations, but we're not gonna assume that uh, we have demonstrations of the task. Okay, um, so the first thing that I'll cover is learning in latent space. Uh, the key idea here is we're gonna learn this embedding, G, uh, G of O, and we're gonna learn a model in this latent space, and then just apply standard model-based reinforcement learning. Um, so here's the diagram that I showed before. What this approach looks like is we're gonna learn a mapping G that maps back from O to S, and then just run our standard model-based RL in our nice latent space. So there are two papers that take this approach uh, that I'll cover. Uh, one is Embed to Control, which is a paper in NIPS 2015, and uh, one is Deep Spatial Autoencoders, which is a paper in ICRA 2016. Um, so this is, Generally what the algorithm looks like, first we're gonna run our base policy uh, to get data, then learn a latent embedding using that data uh, that's gonna map from O to S and learn a dynamics model on our latent space, S prime equals F of SA. Then we're gonna use that model to optimize our policy and then run our, our new policy, append error visiting tuples and repeat. Um, so there's two questions with two kind of key questions of how you would do this. First is what is gonna be our reward for optimizing the policy? Um, how do we use our model to update our policy? Um, in both of these papers, the reward that was used is essentially looks uh, something like this. So you have some reward on the actions, uh, something like penalizing high torques, for example. And additionally, a term that uh, represents the, the negative distance between the embedding of the current observation and the embedding of the goal observation. So you assume access to some goal observation and then just measure the distance in your latent space between your current position, your current state, and your goal state. Um, and that should be a, a negative right there. Um, okay, and then next, how do we optimize our latent embedding? This is actually one of the really big questions in these sort of, sorts of approaches and one of the, um, I think, areas for future work and improvement. Um, so in an embedded control pa paper, they learned an embedding and a model jointly to be able to try and learn an embedding that is predictable. Uh, and they also, so they were using a, a modification of the variational autoencoder, so as both tried learning the embedding that can reconstruct the current image, as well as an embedding that can be predicted using a model. Um, and then uh, in this paper, we, use an autoencoder that had some structure. So in particular, we were enforcing that the bottleneck of the autoencoder represented positions in 2D, um, these 2D feature points, which are quite nice for the 
for the types of robotic tasks that we look at. Um, so in particular, we also in encourage this embedding to be smooth. Um, so to summarize, we, we're learning a smooth and structured embedding. Um, okay, so what, do, what are the results of these sorts of approaches? So uh, in the embed to control paper, they were able to reach a goal image on the simulated robot arm. Um, and so the left is showing the real trajectory of the arm and the right is showing the generated images from the latent space. So it's essentially showing what the latent space thinks the state is. Here's another example with a different goal state and you can see that it's able to move the arm to the desired configuration. Um, and this was learned with about 300 trials, which would correspond roughly to 25 minutes of robot time per task. Uh, and then here are the results of the spatial autoencoder paper. So the robot was able to learn how to do things like pushing a block to a goal, transferring an object to a bowl, uh, and using a spatula to pick up an object and put it into a bowl, and also putting a hook onto a loop, or putting a rope onto a hook. And in these experiments, they required about 125 trials on the real robot, corresponding to about 11 minutes of robot time. Yeah. Um, I don't have time to talk about that now, but I'd be happy to talk about that later. Okay, um, so some of the pros of learning the latent space is that you can learn complex visual skills very efficiently. And the stru a structured representation, if you can find one, can enable very effective learning. Um, one of the downsides of learning a latent space is that usually these approaches use some sort of reconstruction objective to find the latent space. And these objectives might not capture the right representation for the task. And if you can't capture task relevant features, then you won't be able to solve the task. Um, so finding the right representation is really key for these sorts of approaches. Okay, yeah. So in practice, we relearn a different latent space for every task. Um, one thing that I found informally with the spatial autoencoder experiments was that if you wanted to do other tasks with the Lego block, the yellow Lego block, um, the features that we learned for that Lego block were transferable um, if we wanted to do other things with that Lego block. Um, but if we then gave it like a red Lego block or something, um, the features, because we only trained it on yellow Lego blocks, it wasn't able to transfer there. Okay, um, so an aside before I move on to the next approach is that low dimensional embeddings can actually be quite useful for model free approaches as well. Um, so one thing that you can do is you can actually do, learn a latent space and perform model based reinforcement learning in that latent space. Okay, um, so in 2012, uh, Lang et al. performed fitted Q iteration in a latent space to be able to learn uh, a task on a toy slot car. Uh, and also, there was a, a more recent paper that used trust region policy optimization in a learned latent space and was able to learn a policy, uh, this policy on a real robot, uh, in this case for, uh, for throwing an object onto another object. Um, and Typically, you wouldn't be able to apply TRPO on a real robot because of uh, the need for an extreme amount of samples. And so I think that this result is quite impressive and shows that if you have a good latent space, you can learn very, very efficiently, even with algorithms that are typically very inefficient. Another thing that you can do with latent spaces is that you can use them for a reward function. So there was a paper by Pierre Sarmonet this year that was able to learn, so he took a a video demonstration, a video of a human opening a door, acquired a reward function using features that were trained on ImageNet, then ran model-free reinforcement learning using this reward function, and had a robot learn how to open a door using that reward function. I um, mean, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about reward functions and how you get reward functions, fun functions in the real world in the next lecture. Um, and lastly, if you have a reward function, then you can actually use that reward function for learning a good low dimensional latent space. Um, and that was shown in these two papers right here. Okay, um, and then the last approach that I wanna cover is modeling directly in the latent space. Um, what this looks like is uh, first kind of recall model predictive control. Um, what we can do is we can learn a model directly in observation space and run model predictive control in our observation space. 
Um, so here's, uh, for example, you can collect data. Uh, this is a paper from NIPS 2016 and ICRA 2017. We collected data on a collection of robot arms. Um, here's some of the data that we collected. We then trained an action conditioned video prediction model that predicts, given the current image and this future sequence of actions, what is the future video going to look like? So it's kind of an imaginative, visual imagination of the future. Uh, so these are some of the sorts of predictions that you can get from a, a video prediction model like this. And once you have a video prediction model, you can use it to plan. So say this is your current image. Uh, you first consider potential action sequences, maybe these two sequences. Uh, predict the future for each action sequence. So here are, uh, here are two predictions. Pick the future that you like the best and execute the corresponding action. And then repeat steps one through three to replan in real time. So this is essentially just model predictive control in, in pixel space, in image space. Um, so kind of what you can do with this at, once you've learned your model is you can have a human click on a, a point and where they want that point to move to. And the robot can then plan using its video prediction model to achieve the specified goal. Uh, this was learned, the, the model here was learned with about less than two days of unsupervised robot time. So the robots were just making motions on their own. Uh, and in particular, the only human involvement here was just programming some initial motions for the robots to execute and providing some objects to play with. And that's it. Um, so this is quite nice. This is actually more efficient than many reinforcement learning methods, many model-free reinforcement learning methods, and it doesn't require a reward function or supervision during training. Um, and the other benefit here is that we, we uh, Frederick Ebert et al. showed that you can uh, use this approach on, uh, in this case, a Sawyer robot to achieve many different types of goals. Um, so here are some of the, uh, the goals that the robot was able to achieve using the learned model. Question. The, during training the model, there's no reward. Um, there's just some random motions that were programmed in this case. At test time, um, there is a reward function, which is basically trying to move a pixel to a goal position. Um, and the reward function looks something like the negative distance between the pixel, the, the current position of the pixel and the final position of the pixel. In the first paper, optical flow was used for object tracking. Um, in this paper, it was actually just the model zone's predictions were used to uh, track where the pixel was going to move next. I think that a more sophisticated tracking mechanism would lead to better results here. OK, um, so some of the pros and cons of this approach. First, it's entirely self-supervised. You can learn for a variety of tasks. And it's more efficient than single task model-free learning, um, which is quite nice. Some of the downs, well, one downside here is that we can't yet handle as complex skills as model-free methods. Um, but I think that we can get there, hopefully, in the future. OK, um, so that's it for the main part of the lecture. The kind of the things that I covered is, first, why use model-free, why use model-based reinforcement learning? Uh, the main approach is for model-based RL, using local models, as well as handling high-dimensional observations. To review, uh, here's kind of the diagram that I showed first, where we're iterating between collecting samples, fitting a model, and improving the policy. We can estimate the model using supervised learning and improve the policy with respect to the model using, by backpropagating through the model, for example. Um, one of the big challenges that comes up in model-based RL is correcting for model errors. There's a few different ways that you can do this, by refitting uh, the model with new data, by replanning with model predictive control, and using local models. Um, and then if you want to be able to do model-based RL from high-dimensional raw observations, you can learn a latent space, typically with unsupervised learning, or you can model and plan directly in your observation space. Um, I want to put up a few suggested readings on model-based reinforcement learning if you're interested in digging a bit deeper. Uh, the first is TASA et al., which is a good introduction to using model predictive control with a known model. The second is uh, this paper, which is a good thorough paper on guided policy search and learning real robotic vision-based skills. The third is uh, stochastic value gradients, which is a paper that backpropagates through the dynam dynamics model to assist a model-free reinforcement learner. Uh, next is, this is the embedded control paper, which learns a latent space and does model-based reinforcement learning in that latent space. And lastly, 
here is um, the paper on modeling directly in your raw observational space. Um, and if you want to dig even further into some of these topics, um, here's some references. So here's papers on using a known model, more papers on using guided policy search, papers on uh, backpropagating through a model. I didn't get to talk about this, but you can also use inverse models. Uh, and here are the papers on using latent spaces and uh, using deep models with MPC. Um, and lastly, one thing that I uh, didn't cover today, but I think there's a lot of really exciting directions in combining model-based and model-free approaches. Um, here's some of them. So one thing you could do is use rollouts from model as experience. You can use a model as a baseline uh, when you use policy gradient methods. You can use a model for exploration. You can use, you can basically have a model-free policy that's capable of doing planning. Um, there's a couple of interesting papers there. And lastly, you can also uh, use a model-based approach to look ahead into the future and plan. Uh, then quickly, I'd like to show a comparison between kind of the pros and cons of model-based approaches versus model-free approaches. Um, so in model-based approaches, it's often easy to collect data in a scalable way without need for a reward function. It's possible to transfer across tasks. And they typically require a smaller amount of data, a smaller amount of supervised data when learning tasks. Um, some of the downsides is that models don't optimize for task performance. Um, this is kind of the trade-off between transferability. Uh, sometimes it's harder to learn the model than the policy. And we often need more assumptions to learn more complex skills, such as the skills that I showed with guided policy search. Um, and then in terms of model-free approaches, they make very little assumptions beyond the need for a reward function. They're very effective for learning complex policies, but they require a lot of experience, very high sample complexity, and they're not directly transferable across tasks. Um, that said, uh, this is kind of an overview if you want to decide between them for applying reinforcement learning to your particular algorithm. But ultimately, we want both. We want an agent that's able to both plan and use model-based approaches, uh, learn, learn to predict its environment, and we want also want policies that can very quickly and rapidly react to changes in, to, to different um, tasks, different changes, uh, and, and that's the model-free element. Um, and lastly, to conclude, uh, I think model-based reinforcement learning is actually extremely underexplored. I think there's been a lot of work, especially recently, on model-free-based methods, but I think that model-based methods haven't been explored as much. Uh, and I think that two exciting areas of research that have been quite active recently are using model-based approaches with high-dimensional observations, which I talked about today, as well as combining elements of model-based planning with model-free policies. Okay, um, that's the end. I won't have time to take questions now, uh, but if you want to find me after the next lecture, I'd be happy to take specific questions then. Next in the schedule, we have lunch. Sandy and I are going to be uh, hosting a lunch with the women participants. We're going to be meeting on the Hearst Mining Circle right there on the map. So we're currently at Stanley Hall, and uh, Sandy and I will be meeting women participants that want to have lunch on the Hearst Mining Circle. And that's it. Thank you.